All right, so today we're gonna be talking about homeless youth and how it's affected um, us on a global, national, and state level, you know, all throughout the country. And um, I just wanna thank you for doing this interview. Uh, this is my not only my dad, but also a prominent member of the community. And he has done a lot, uh, not only through Eddie House, but with Common Spirit now. And you've worked at both uh, a national and a local level. Can you kind of tell us about yourself and how that's been? Yeah, first, uh, thanks, Peyton, for having me on and, and doing this project with you. And I think of all the different interviews I've done, this is uh, definitely one that's pretty special and a little bit different. Um, I guess to give a little bit of background, I've been in the human service arena for over 20 years now, over 25 years, actually, just really looking at marginalized populations and the struggles that they have and trying to figure out how to come up with different types of solutions to have an impact that was sustainable, not only for them, but for the systems that we live in. And so, you know, for 14 and a half years, I ran a substance use treatment facility called Step Two for women and children, helping them get clean and sober and break the cycle of addiction um, with long-term treatment, as well as housing affiliated with that. I've also been the CEO of the Nevada Humane Society, working with pets and animals, as well as trying to figure out how to bridge the gaps between people who are struggling as well as animals. Um, there is a connection there. Most recently, I ran Eddie House, which is a homeless youth facility. It was a drop-in center, and I uh, was blessed to gather a lot of community support and be able to turn that drop-in center into a 24-hour program servicing homeless uh, youth experiencing homelessness between the ages of 18 to 25. Uh, we did that pretty quick. It was a pretty large growth spurt. And now I'm the system vice president for Common Spirit Health, which is the largest hospital, nonprofit hospital system in the world. And I run the National Foundation, which focuses on health justice. So we strive to find all those individuals and groups that are really struggling with, whether it's homelessness, violence prevention, um, health and mental health a number of those things, um, looking for solutions, support, putting together other collaborative entities, uh, corporations, and, and trying to people help people across the country. Sweet, so looking, looking at uh, homelessness on a global level, what do you think is the main cause of homelessness? We're looking at the numbers here, 100 million homeless children alone. What do you think goes into that? Well, globally, there's so many problems. Um, you know, when you're talking about third world countries or you're talking about different types of systems that people are in, there are all types of oppressive political issues that come into play in that as well. There are a lot of people that are in power and people who have the money tend to be people in power who want to stay in power. If they want to stay in power, it means it's going to keep people oppressed. Um, 100 million homeless children is just something that just, I mean, it's heart wrenching. And there are different reasons in different countries and everywhere you go. So there's not really one succinct answer to that. But what I can tell you is it does not get any better until we find enough people who are privileged and willing to be allies in identifying, increasing the awareness and providing support and solutions to these children who should not be dealing with this. You know, I look at this stat that you've got up right here and I see 250,000 deaths weekly due to diseases and malnutrition. Those are kids that really shouldn't die. It's 2022 and we're talking about the deaths of, of children because of the oppressed situations that they're living in. And if 12 million children die before the age of five years old, we're not doing enough. And we need to figure out how to solve these problems but each problem has a different solution and they really need to be looked at, um, not using a cookie cutter approach, but figuring out how can we come up with solutions that are really catered to whatever those individual problems might be. So you talk about solutions. Uh, what do you think, I guess, just talking about the disease and malnutrition numbers globally, what do you think is a, a small step that we could take, I mean, at home, here at home to, to help that number, to help fight that? Well, here at home, we waste a lot of food. As Americans, we throw 
a lot of food away on a daily basis. We have surplus of food in certain parts of the country where we might have a shortage of different types of food. One of the things that we really need to focus on is the nutritional value of the foods that we're putting out. So when you're looking at what kids get with, at an early age, we're not giving them, a lot, of, a lot of these kids are getting junk food. The access to those things are not necessarily nutritional. Therefore, it doesn't lead to healthy long-term living. And if we're talking about health justice, um, your zip code and area code should not determine the quality of life that you live or the quality of foods that you eat. And it does. So when we're asking about those solutions, we got to get farmers heavily involved. We also need to get families that are struggling with these particular issues a seat at the table so they can tell us what are, the, what are some of the solutions. We always want to get the answers from the people who aren't struggling. And that's not the way to go about it. Right. Um, you know, but we do need to take a look at what are, we, what are we feeding our kids? And then these meal programs we have in the schools, some cheap really just honestly crappy stuff that they have access to. Yeah. So looking at it from a, a nationwide perspective, we have 4.2 million homeless children here in the United States right now. And the overall homeless number is much higher than that. What do you think are, are some ways that we could combat that? And what are some small steps that we could help, you know, our own backyards, I guess, at the nationwide level? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to take a look at the big why. Why in 2022 do we have 4.2 million homeless children? And um, a number of those children that are experiencing homelessness are under the ages of six. We have to look at the systems in which we live and navigate and start questioning the roots of those systems. Oftentimes we talk about our systems as if they're broken. They're not broken. They were built this way. And so if there are this many kids that are struggling, uh, that means that their parents were struggling and probably their grandparents struggled. Why? Why is that? And um, looking at our welfare systems, looking at our social service systems, are they, are they really servicing who they were intended to service in the first place? And, it's, and, it, and I'm talking about this really vaguely but there are a large number of programs and services that we oftentimes throw out there and can keep throwing money at, and they don't necessarily work. We need to really reward those systems that are strong, that are sustainable, and then start scaling those programs. Identify ones that are, that are really efficient. Scale those so that we can reach the masses. The problem that we have in New Mexico with homelessness and youth is gonna be very similar to the homelessness youth problem we have in Nevada. So let's go across the country. Covenant House, doing a fantastic job. What are you guys doing that's different than perhaps we're doing down in, in Louisiana? And let's take those solutions and put them in place. Yeah, so I know from your experience at Eddie House, you did things very different. You know, when you came in, the numbers of overall homeless children and, and equity in, your, in Eddie House jumped through the roof. So, and, and we, what we've seen is, what I think you've seen as well is that wealth is, there's no deficit, like I put in this st little statistic right here. Well, there's no deficit of wealth in the United States. It's just the deficit of wealthy people that are willing to contribute. What are ways that, you know, I guess, getting in touch with those people and, and getting that wealth distributed so that these children aren't hurting? That's a great question, Peyton. Most of the time and most of the programs that I have been a part of running. The first thing I do is I always hire smarter people than myself to put around me. And I hire people who are really good at listening. There's a, there's a uh, reason why the words silent and listen have all the same letters. Oftentimes you get people who get in the positions that I've been in, they don't wanna be silent, they just wanna be loud. Um, you gotta stop and listen. And you wanna listen to your community because in the community, people with wealth want to be help, helpful. They wanna know what they do, what they can do to help. They oftentimes have no idea. So what I did at Eddie House, um, very similar to what I was able to do at Step 2 and all great teams, was identify what are the problems. And then when we start talking about the solutions, we design different pathways in which different people can help with those solutions. So the, the problem says that X amount of people need this kind of help. This many people need this kind of help. X amount of people need this kind of help. Then we go and find 
people who have the ability to help and say, hey, here are these people. Maybe this is a group that you'd really like to be a part of, of helping and create pathways that make it very simple. So maybe John has $15 million, but John doesn't want to do a lot of work, but he wants to be helpful in some way. And he has an affinity for certain type of kids. We create the pathway and say, look, here are these kids right here. Falls into the group that you're passionate about. And he goes, okay, I want to write a check. And he just writes a check. And that's okay. He can write that check each and every year. And then there's Susie over here who says, well, I want to come in. I want to fix meals for kids. Okay, let's let you help where you want to help. And most nonprofits get very myopic and they just think, I only want help this way. This is all we need. We just need money, 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 money. And they go about it without really catering to the donor with the same veracity that you're catering to the, the, uh, the clients that are in need of help. And as a CEO or an executive director or a program or services, you need to be that liaison from help to those who have um, wealth and have the ability to give the help and create the lanes in which they can drive to make the mission and vision successful. Okay. Hey, you also, so you talk about other nonprofits and how they may not be taking the right steps moving forward. And like I mentioned before, your time at Eddie House, you were very successful. So what, how do you think we can take that formula from Eddie House and grow it and scale it up to a national and global level? Eddie House has the, all the capability in the world to be, and I'm no longer there, but they have the capability in the world to be a, a national program. While I was there, we did receive some national recognition. Our visitors from the president's office came out and anointed an award with us. Uh, we were able to do that at step two on a couple of different occasions as well. So that has to be done with, first of all, selflessness. So the leader has to really focus on not being a boss. You have to be a leader and there's a big difference. So organizations need to find someone who understands business practices, who understands how to lead people and get them motivated, whether it's people who work there, people in the community, people who are receiving services and pull together everyone to be a team and figure out on the bus where their seat is so that we can get moving and, dr and drive down to towards our mission and what we're trying to accomplish. And these programs are scalable because these type of needs are everywhere. So there is a point where efficiency and effectiveness meet in all businesses. And oftentimes people in nonprofit forget nonprofits only a status. It's still a business and you have to operate it as such as a business and constantly be evaluating how do we get this part to be more efficient? How are our services going to be effective? Measure those, scrutinize them, and then make sure that when you, when you fail, fail forward and encourage people to fail. It's okay to fail We're, because if you're not failing, you're not trying. So fail is um, your first attempt in learning is what that stands for. So get out there and fail. Um, so those are the things that I push on really hard with every organization I've ever run. Okay, well, that is our time for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixon, for giving me your time today. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you and good luck in all your future pursuits. And you're done with this semester. I am, I am. All right.